The Chicago Lawyer, 2014 Annual Settlement Survey says, and I quote, the highest settlement for an individual plaintiff was $40 million and was handled by Devin Bruce of Power, Rogers, and Smith. The case involved the city of Dixon, Illinois, and its former controller, who embezzled nearly $54 million from city coffers over 22 years. The Lee County suit alleged that the bank where the stolen funds were deposited and the accounting firm that performed city audits were negligent in failing to uncover the crime. Federal authorities b believe it is the largest municipal fraud theft in United States history. Devin Bruce is a partner with the law firm of Power, Rogers, and Smith. He is a longtime member of the City Club of Chicago and serves as chairman of the Illinois State Board of Investment, which oversees roughly $20 billion. Devin and his wife, Yvonne, let's give her a round of applause, Yvonne. <laughs> Devin clearly married up, way up. They are the proud parents of four beautiful children, Cormac, Aoife, Kieran, and Neve. Ladies and gentlemen, Devin Bruce. Devin? Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for the privilege of allowing me to make some remarks about the City of Dixon case. Um, before I do, I just want to make a couple remarks. Um, there are some very important people in my lives in the room, and I just want to talk to you and uh, recognize those people. First of all, many of the us here in the room are City Club members and we come to these luncheons on a regular basis and we recognize the speakers and the donors. I, I think what's important is that we recognize Dr. Paul Green and Jay Doherty because this would not happen but for them. So if we get a round of applause for both of them. There are a lot of friends in the audience and I, I, I will be remiss if I didn't recognize some of them. My longtime friend from Springfield, Illinois, he and I went to law school together. Paul Durbin is sitting in the back. Paul, thanks for coming, I appreciate it. I saw Justice Matt DeLord from the appellate court here. Justice, thank you for coming. My good friend at the Celtic table, Chairman and CEO of the Concord Group, Ed Stritch, and Chairman and CEO of the Signature Bank, Mick O'Rourke. Mick, hopefully we're gonna have something interesting for you to say. I see the director of Navy Pier, Marilyn Gardner. I'm on the board of the Navy Pier, and she is a fabulous director and, and head of Navy Pier. Marilyn, thank you for everything that you do. <laughs> Dr. Paul Green did point out that the president of the Special Olympics, Jen Kramer, is also a candidate for the 23rd Ward, and I didn't want to, 43rd Ward, I misspoke, and I wanted to make sure that that was recognized, Jen. Good luck. Um, Two of my partners are here, uh, bar none, the finest trial lawyer this city has ever seen, and my very good friend and senior partner, Joseph A. Power, Jr. Joe, thanks for coming over. <laughs> Commissioner Larry Rogers, uh, there's probably going to be some questions after this event for you. Uh, thanks for coming, Larry. Um, and my assistant, Stacy Dalton, and last but not least, I want to recognize uh, two other people. I see in the back of the room one of my uh, fellow board members from the Illinois State Board of Investment, Michelle Bush. Michelle, thank you for coming. She looks over that state pension fund. And lastly, um, this individual grew up in a farm in the west of Ireland. She grew up uh, in a Gale talk where they only speak uh, the Irish language. Um, she went all the way through high school. She graduated first in her family ever to graduate from high school, first in her family ever to graduate from college. She came here, worked at a pharmaceutical company in the night shift, keeping in mind she went all the way through school, University College Galway, in the Irish language. She is my best friend, she is my wife, and Yvonne, thank you for coming. So, um, Mayor Burke, um, it is publicly disclosed in the newspaper last week in the Sauk Valley News, Mayor Jim Burke could not be here today because uh, cancer was identified in his prostate. He had emergent surgery. He had been looking forward to this speech for months, literally, and he and I have been talking about it. 
He, uh, this all came about last week. He expresses his apologies and um, is very disappointed that he cannot be here. Jay, maybe at some future time we can welcome him back to the City Club. Um, that having been said, let me just get a feel for the audience. How many lawyers do we have in the room? If I could see a show of the hands. Okay. And how many accountants do we have in the room? A fair few accountants. And how many bankers do we have in the room? Okay. And how many local government officials do we have in the room or representatives they're from? So this is demonstrative of the reaction that we've gotten from this case. Over 20 years I've been practicing uh, law in the private sector and I've never had a case that has generated as much interest as this case. And the interest is from a variety of different sectors. And really the questions that ultimately come down to is, Devin, how did she steal this money? How did she steal this money, number one, and how did you get that recovery, number two? And so um, when Jay and I and Dr. Green talked about this speech, really I'm going to try and address today those two questions. How did she steal the money, first of all, and how did you get the recovery, which gets to the point of how were the banks and the accounting firms negligent and what transpired. So first, for those of you who didn't read the front page Wall Street Journal articles and all of the attenuant articles that were uh, you know, present for months surrounding Rita Crunwell, Rita Crenwell was the treasurer and comptroller for this small town out in western Illinois, Dixon, Illinois. She was the treasurer and comptroller and she worked there from 1982, 1983 rather, until the time that she was arrested in 2012. During that time period, what we now know is she stole $53.7 million. $53.7 million. It's the largest municipal embezzlement in the history of this country and the recovery that we were able to obtain is the largest recovery in the context of a municipal embezzlement in the history of this country. So it, just the numbers alone make this a very unique and interesting circumstance. Now, just so we're clear, my role in this case was on the civil side. There was, I was retained by the city of Dixon and our firm to represent the city of Dixon to investigate to determine what, if any, other culpable parties were out there other than Rita. We know that Rita stole the money, right? We know that that money was stolen. The issue becomes whether there was uh, individuals that were responsible for identifying it earlier and detecting it so this tragedy didn't happen. That was my role. And the same uh, parallel track, the U.S. Attorney's Office and the U.S. Marshal's Office was involved pursuing the criminal action. So just to be clear, um, her assets that were ultimately seized through the forfeiture action, that was handled by the U.S. Marshal's Office and the U.S. Attorney's Office. So I think before we get too far in this, it's important to understand kind of the backdrop of the whole circumstances surrounding these events. The city of Dixon, it, it's a small town. Obviously, I spent a lot of time there. It's actually a beautiful town. It's 16,000 people. That's the population, 16,000 people. It's on the beautiful Rock River. It's President Ronald Reagan's hometown. I think we've got a picture here. It literally is that, that Main Street is the Main Street. It is uh, the beautiful Rock River's there, and this is Ronald Reagan's home, home that he grew up in. So this is kind of the idea. If you ever haven't had a chance to go up there, and I'm sure Mayor Burke will watch this video tomorrow morning, and he will be proud to tell you that I said you should go out there and take a bit. Beautiful town, all right? So in the city of Dixon, they had in their employment no full-time accountant no part-time account, no CPA. And I think that's important to note, to understand the backdrop. Why? And the reason why is it's a small town and a small administration. Um, there's a mayor, there's five commissioners. Now the, the mayor and the five commissioners, this is a part-time position, right? So they are, there's a retired barber, a retired school teacher, the mayor is a real estate agent. And so you get the context in which it happened. In the city hall itself, if we can see the city hall, that's city hall. And that's where this all happened. Okay, this is a small red brick building. On the other side of that is the beautiful Rock River. And on the second floor, the first floor is the water department. And on the second floor were three administrative employees during all this time period. Rita Crunwell, Kathy Swanson, who was the city clerk, we'll talk about her in a moment, and Stephanie Terranova. Okay, that comprised the administration. And there's nothing wrong with that, I suggest to you, because it's a small town, right? You can't have an army of people. So this is kind of the context in which uh, this all occurred. Now, Rita, Rita was the treasurer and comptroller. She earned $80,000 a year. Um, she also had an avid pastime, and she was very good at it. She was an equestrian, and she was probably one of the better equestrians in this country. She bought and sold and showed horses 
and the evidence will show that she did a very good job of it. Um, in the world of uh, horses and equestrian activities, which is not my specialty, this American Quarter Horse Association, she was this leading owner, and now, from what we now know, it, she may have had a little bit of an added advantage when she could buy these horses and spend millions of dollars, but that was her passion in life, was horses, and she spent a lot of money on that. Now, there was an accounting firm, a very large accounting firm. They advertised that they were one of the largest accounting firms in the United States, Clifton Gunderson, which became Clifton Larson Allen. For over two decades, Clifton performed a number of financial services for the city of Dixon. They did the payroll. They did the bill payment. They paid the bills for the city. They kept on their computer ledger all of the finances of the city. They prepared the financial statements for the city of Dixon. And for over two decades, they also performed the city audit of the city of Dixon. Now, um, I hear some. That's the, that's the accountants there for you. Um, oh, it's going to get better. So um, for this office of this accounting firm, like any, any accounting firm, right? Like, you know, they have uh, branches all over the Midwest and the United States. There was a branch there in Dixon, and that city of Dixon account, right, the city of Dixon account for that bank branch was either their largest or one of the largest accounts that they had every year for over 20 years. So it was an important account for that accounting office. And during the time period that's relevant for our discussions, that accounting firm billed the city of Dixon for these services over $1 million. Now, I think it's important to note the relationship between the city of Dixon staff, i.e. Rita Crunwell, and Clifton. There was a very close relationship between Rita and Clifton. Rita was on their softball team. Rita would go out to dinner with the partners. The, uh, the partner would go over to her house and let the dogs out, and they'd have lunch together, and um, they'd have beers together after work and things of that nature. So there was a very close relationship. Now, Rita, around town, keep in mind small town. So if anybody knows anything or you grew up in a small town, everybody knows everything about other people in the small town. I see some nodding heads in the back. So Rita, not only because of her equestrian activities, but because of her personal lifestyle, the way she conducted herself, sh she was quite extravagant, okay? And I think we have some pictures here. These are just some of the many pictures. You may have seen these already in the press. This is an example of her horse trailer that was sold at the time of the auction that was held out there by the U.S. Marshal's office. These are very expensive, and I think we have other examples. Mm -hmm. We've got, this is a mobile home that she had that she would utilize for equestrian activities. I didn't know, I don't have a mobile home, but I didn't know that they got to be $4 million. But this, she had a $4 million mobile home. Keep in mind, this is a woman, a, an employee of the city of Dixon that made $80,000 a year. And so I think we've got other examples of her. She liked her jewelry. That's not a knockoff Rolex, that's the real thing. <laughs> We talked about jewelry earlier. Those are real gems and diamonds. So she uh, was very careful about her appearance, and she dressed very well. So you say, well, Devin, how, what, what was going on in the city? Why didn't the people in the city, what questions were they asking? Well, it was simple. Her mantra, her message, the way she portrayed herself is that she earned all of this money from the equestrian activities. So she, remember I said she was very good and that's true. So she would raise these horses and sell them. She was a breeder and also she would go and compete around the world, uh, around the country rather, and sell these horses and do these winnings and she would get winnings from the, from the uh, showing of these horses. So that's what she portrayed to the public as where she was getting all of her money. So that answered all the questions at City Hall and elsewhere. Now, this is where the audience participation at the City Club comes in. Who is the one person in the city of Dixon that would actually know how much money Rita Crunwell made or didn't make in her equestrian activities? Who's the one person? Her accountant. And who was her accountant? The same partners that were the head of office in Dixon that was the relationship partner for the city of Dixon account was the same accountant that filled out her tax returns for over 20 years and completed her tax returns. Now, I'm just describing the backdrop of what I thought was important in approaching this case as a civil trial lawyer. Now, 
In order to understand what, if any, mistakes were made by the accountants or the banks, I had to first understand what, how did she steal the money, right? How did she steal the money? Because depending upon how she stole the money, uh, obviously it has an impact on whether or not there's any culpable parties. I, I'm, for purposes of time, I'm going to condense this. She stole the money in a variety of different ways and a variety of different accounts. But by and large, the vast majority of the way in which she stole the money, over $40 million of the 53.7 that she stole, she stole it from taking money from an account at Fifth Third Bank called the Capital Development Fund. It was an absolutely legitimate account. Every municipality or body politic, you have a capital development fund to pay for things such as roads and bridges and pickup trucks and tow trucks and things, stoplights and things of that nature. That's the capital fund, right? So there was a capital fund at Fifth Third Bank and its predecessor banks in the little bank branch there in the city of Dixon. And that was a legitimate account. They probably made, maybe had 10 or 12 accounts there the city did at that bank. Now what she did was she would transfer monies from the capital development fund to this bogus account that she uh, set up unilaterally on her own at the same bank. So she marched in and she on her own without a City of Dixon resolution opened an account on her own in the name of the City of Dixon and then that was set up at the same bank and then she would transfer literally transfer funds from account, account A to account B and then from account B, she would spend all these personal expenditures. Now, we're going to flesh this out a little bit more, but that's the basic way that she stole the money. Now, specifically, you say, well, Devin, how did she transfer the money? And this is important for our discussion. She, um, it is commonplace in Illinois and throughout uh, this country that you're going to have multiple bodies, uh, body politics that are going to contribute to a capital development fund. So a simple example would be, we're going to build this bridge, and it's on a state highway, and it goes through the city of Dixon, right? So the state of Illinois is going to pay for that, and the city of Dixon is going to pay for a portion of that, right? So they're going to make a contribution to the, to the, the, the repair or the building of that bridge. So, and that's very commonplace. That happens all the time in municipalities. So the municipality, for example, the city of Bloomington is going to write a check to the Illinois Department of Transportation for their contribution for the road and bridge. And so that's what Rita was doing, was purportedly making payments from the capital development fund to this bogus account for false bills that never, for capital projects that never existed. So Rita was smart, and she thought, well, now how am I going to get away from this? I've never met Rita, but this is what she did. So she created false invoices from, purportedly from the city, uh, the state of Illinois to the city of Dixon, and that's what the payments were purportedly for. Um, and I, and, and just, it was very telling in, in, in analyzing the theft and how it increased over the years. This was almost analogous to some, um, some other types of cases where you pe see people um, who are stealing money, right? She stole a very small amount of money at the beginning, 1988, 1990, 1991. She stole very small amounts of money. And by the end, right before she was arrested, she was stealing as much money as the total operating revenue of the city of Dixon. And so it's very telling because she got away with it and she kept doing that. So in any event, um, Mayor Burke was going to handle this, and, and I've heard him talk about this, about how this was actually found out, how this theft was found out. Now, from my perspective, I think it's very telling that this theft wasn't found out by the trained, educated, licensed, paid accountants for over 20 years. It wasn't found by the accountants. The heroine in this case is Clerk Kathy Swanson. Uh, Kathy, um, was doing some work, well, let me take a step back. So Rita would go around the country and do these equestrian activities, and she would be gone for long periods of time. So somebody had to step in and do her job while she was gone. So Kathy Swanson, the clerk, would put together this little kind of mile-high summary of the city's finances and present it to the city council when they meet Monday night at the city council meetings every third Monday or whatever it is. And so she was preparing this, and she was trying to make the numbers work, and so she called over to Fifth Third Bank and said, I need all the accounts. I can't understand. No, I need all the accounts. And so some junior level person over at Fifth Third Bank faxed over all of the accounts and included the City of Dixon account, which it was in the name of City Dixon, but it was the bogus account where she did all of her personal expenditures. So when Kathy Swanson saw that and identified, no, this doesn't work. How, what, what are all these jewelry? What's all this? You know, what are all these personal expenditures? She did what a good public official is supposed to do. She did her job. She marched down the hall, and she gave it to the mayor. And the mayor looked at it, 
and again, if he was here, he has a very emotional recollection of this events. His heart stopped, his stomach dropped, and he said, okay, and he did what he was supposed to do, and he called the FBI, and that was in the fall of 2011. And then he collaborated and cooperated with the FBI from the fall of 2011 until she was ultimately less, uh, arrested in 2012 so that he could, they could make their case rock solid. And I don't, I, I would suggest to you that's not probably part of his job description as when he was originally m running for mayor of the city of Dixon. But he did the right thing. And I think those are the two people that stand out in my mind as the hero and heroine of this story. So real quickly, in terms of our firm's involvement in the case, we went through hundreds of thousands of pages of bank statements. We went through two decades of City of Dixon council meeting minutes. And those are important because, as I'll show you in a minute, one of the tools of an accountant acting as an auditor is to look at city council minute meetings to find out if particular things were approved. We reviewed thousands of pages of uh, work papers. For those accountants that are in the audience, you'll know what work papers are readily. Work papers are the documents that accountants use to kind of make sure they're doing their checklist, to make sure when they're doing an audit that they check certain things, and that's important for this case. And we took numerous depositions of the current and former Clifton employees and the bank employees, and based upon all that evidence that we accumulated, this is what we found out. Now, Clifton was negligent in a number of different respects in the performance of their duties. Um, we have to start off with the understanding that as auditors, accountants have a duty and responsibility to identify fraud or what's called in the accounting world misstatement, right? So um, we agree that millions of dollars flying out the door is fraud or misstatement. So the standards require them to identify that. Now, in terms of... Uh, the way that she stole the money and the way that particular mistakes were made here, when an accountant comes in to do an annual audit, he or she, that audit team, has to verify, amongst other things, capital assets. Remember I talked about she took the money from the capital development fund, so I'm not going to talk about all the different things an auditor does, but for purposes of our discussion today, accountants are supposed to verify fixed and capital assets. So you have to verify, for example, if you bought a pickup truck and there's an invoice, you've got to make sure the pickup truck was bought. If you're going to spend $500,000 on a road project, you have to make sure that there's a road project that it was actually done. So there's many tools in a tool belt for the accountants to do that. There's many different tools that they teach in accounting school. 101, how do you verify capital or fixed assets? Now the first thing that you do, the cardinal rule, the cardinal rule is you look at the piece of paper. You look at the piece of paper to see if it looks unusual or out of the ordinary. Now I'm not suggesting, and I never suggested in this case, that simply by looking at the face of a bill, an accountant has a duty and an obligation to say that's fraudulent. That, that, that that's, that's a made up bill. I'm not suggesting that, and nor do the standards require that. But if it looks odd or unusual, the accountants have a duty and a responsibility to further investigate, right? So now keep in mind that these, this accounting firm was familiar with bills from the Illinois State Department of Transportation from many other audits and many other road projects throughout the state. And I think we have an example here of the Illinois Department of Transportation. So this is what a bill should look like. This is a bill from the Illinois Department of Transportation sent to the city of Dixon. It's a form bill. It's the same bill that you would see in every different context. There's a contact person in Springfield. There's a phone number. You've got the logo at the top. It's just like a bill that we all get at our homes, right? It's a bill that we get a phone bill from Meritech at a home. It says Devin Bruce and the phone bill and so on, right? It's got all the particulars. It's got the road project, the amount that's owed and so on. That's a bill, and that's what it should look like. Now, why don't we now turn to the false invoice? Now, this is the invoice that Rita Crunwell, she generated 177 of these false bills, and that is the way she stole over $42 million of the 53.7. There's no Illinois Department of Transportation uh, logo at the top. There's no contact information here. Um, I don't know about you, but every government form that I've ever seen, if it's a form, it's not misspelled. If you look at section, <laughs> under the section S-E-C-T-O-N, it's oh. misspelled. It's a totally <laughs> different format. It's a totally different format than the bill that you would receive from all of the other state of Illinois um, road projects. So now, this is the way, so we suggested, we suggested that and maintain that when the audit field team was reviewing these capital assets, which they were required to do as their job duty when they did the annual audit, 
that this looked out of the ordinary and they should have investigated further. Now, I was concerned in prosecuting this case that there would be a claim that they did not see these invoices. Now, that fails for a number of reasons. First of all, these were large sums of money. So what they teach you in accounting school 101 is the larger the bill proportioned to the budget, the more likely you're going to focus on that bill. Lester's nodding his head. Yes. And so these are large sums of money. These aren't $8,000. These were for $500,000 and five, you know, uh, well, $500,000 and $300,000 and so on. I'm going to show you some of the checks. So what we're showing is the gravity of the amount also affects the amount that you investigate into it. Okay. So and, and so I was concerned that the accountants may not have seen these, but in working through their work papers in the accounting world, you do these little checks on the worksheets, and every one of these checks, every one of these invoices, there was a check next to it. So they did see each of these 177 invoices. So remember when I was talking about the tool belt that accountants have to make sure that there's no fraud or embezzlement, the tool belt? So there's things that you can do to identify in verifying fixed or capital assets that accountant can do. And I'll just go through a few of these. You can go down and speak to the city engineer. The engineer was down the hall from the administrative staff. The, uh, the accounting team, the field audit team, actually did the audit in the city council chambers in that red brick building I showed you. All they have to do is go down the hall and say, well, tell us about this road or bridge project. Never happened in 20 years. They could review the city council meeting minutes. That's a cardinal way that they go about it. Because if you're going to have a big capital or road project, it's going to be approved, right? The city council is going to talk about it. We're going to contribute this much to this toll booth or whatever it is, and we're going to vote on it, and it's going to be in the minutes. Well, obviously, none of these are in the minutes because it never happened. None of these ever happened. So that was never verified or checked. Accountants also actually do kind of basic, uh, for lack of a better term, grunt work. They go out to the capital projects, and if you're talking about a, a toll booth, they actually go out and say, okay, the toll booth's here, and I'm going to take a picture of it, and I'm going to put it in my file so I verify that the toll booth was built. Did never do that. Now, you can also call the vendor. Remember, she's leaving off the phone number here, notably. But you can call the vendor and ask the vendor, did you send an invoice? Because that, in the world of accounting, this, there's a term called confirm, confirm. Did you confirm this? Did you confirm that? That's a magic word, uh, word in the world of accounting. And you just call the vendor. That never happened here. Um, and lastly, um, and I would note, um, processes are very important to, to accountants. The way a process is set up and followed. If a process is not followed, that's a roadmap to fraud occurring. In, in these circumstances in which she's writing these very large checks for fraudulent bills going from account A to account B, they never generated all of the internal requisition forms, gave it to Clifton to put on the computer ledger, and had Clifton pay the bills. These were all handwritten bills from her, which is a huge red flag in the world of accounting when you're circumventing a process. So it was our contention that any of those measures that would have been taken in their tool belt if any of those were taken, and Clifton admitted to that in their cross-examination, if there was a two-minute phone call down to Springfield to ask about any one of these invoices, we wouldn't be here today. Now, um, there are other ways in which this tragedy could have been prevented, and that was my reference, I think, that we talked earlier about the personal tax returns. Um, when you're doing a personal tax return for someone, there is not a duty and responsibility on an accountant to investigate. So my accountant doesn't have a duty and responsibility to investigate me when he is filling out my tax return. But that's not the fact pattern that we had here. This was the same accounting firm that chose to make the decision to do both her personal tax return as well as the tax return uh, knowing of the city of Dixon, knowing that she's at the epicenter of the financial transactions at the city of Dixon where they had already identified a lack of segregation of duties and an internal control problem. So Clifton had been saying, oh, there's an uh, internal control problem, there's an internal control problem. And so they knew that, right? So what did they find out in their tax returns? Without getting into any uh, great details, because this gets into a very uh, uh, detailed accounting analysis, but if you do a cash flow in and a cash flow out analysis of her tax returns in 2005, she made on paper over $304,000 than she took in. In other words, here's a person making $80,000 as a city employee, and she, on her tax returns that Clifton completed, made on paper more than $300,000 to which there was no documentation whatsoever. 
None. So like when we do a job, if we get a W-2 from the firm or if we get a 1099 as an independent contractor or if we sell uh, capital gains, if we sell a house or a piece of property, all of these different transactions, there are documents that establish what we made or lost, right? This is what, what, what you have. In this circumstance, in, in 2005, there were over $300,000 to which there was nothing there. There was no explanation where the money came from, none. And then in, if you look in 2000, and, and in the world of accounting, that's a huge red flag, especially when you're dealing with someone who's at the epicenter of an area that's already got a segregation of duty internal control problem. Now, in 2006, she disclosed and they signed off on over $461,000 in income to which there was not a single document for. And I asked them in the deposition, you know, where, where, what, were you concerned about this? Did you ever talk about it? And the answer was yes. We did ask where she get the money, which in the accounting world is, is huge. And the explanation was, she said she had a backer. Who's the backer? I don't know. What's the backer for? I don't know. So, um, you know, um, it, it, you're starting to get the picture. Um, and so, but it gets worse. So in 2005, the industry standard in accounting changed. So what the federal government said, and again, without getting into a, a detailed discussion, the summation is in 2005, the law and the industry standard changed. And if you were doing all of these, what we call non-attest services, so services for like the payroll and the computer ledger, if you're doing these non-attest services, then you can't at the same time do the auditing work. It's like having somebody else fill out your final exam and then you signing your paper at the bottom, right? This is, this, the, the, the audit opinion is sacred to accountants. So if you're gonna give an audit opinion and, a, and a, one that has no material findings, you have to do all of the work for that. So the law changed and this firm was doing all of this non-attest work and they're still doing the audit at the same time. So what did they do? They went to the mom and pop, the sworn testimony from the mom and pop auditing firm uh, out there in Western Illinois with two accountants was that they came to them and they said, look, we want you to do the audit opinion. We will do all the work. You just sign off on the opinion. That's what the man testified to, okay? And so, unfortunately, he agreed to that arrangement. So from 2005 onward, it was Clifton's contention that they were only doing a compilation and not an audit. Okay, and for those of you that are in the accounting world, a compilation is simply kind of gathering the documents together and, and showing it, and an audit is a attestation that they have examined the documents in detail. So how do we know, and if we, I think we can go quickly through this. Um, over and over, after 2005, I found in the thousands of emails, I found documents where they're referencing to Rita, after 2005, here's our bill for the audit work. They didn't use compilation before lawyers and lawsuits. They used the word audit. Here's the audit, city audit. We're billing you $37,000, and that's in 2000. And it just goes on and on and on. So, you know, the, the idea that they were not performing the audit didn't hold any water. And then lastly, uh, we have uh, bank, there's the city audit from 2010. This is from Clifton to the city, 2010, city audit. So they continued to do the audit long after 2005 when the law changed. So what happened with bank confirmations? So real quickly for those bankers in the room, Mick, I see you very interested in this. In the auditing process, when you're doing an audit, you, you reach out to the banks of your clients and as of April 30th of whatever year or whatever the date that you choose, you wanna make sure you know all of the accounts and what to the penny is in every account. That's important to do the audit to make sure all the numbers reconcile. Now, in that world of, of accounting, if you've got an account from a client or a municipality in this case that you don't know about, that is a huge red flag for fraud occurring, right? So it, unknown accounts are a big problem. So in 2009, <laughs> here's the 2009. Now, Rita as the treasurer and the, and, and the person that was actually there, she would be actually disclosing the, some of the accounts and we asserted and we maintain that the banks have a duty and responsibility to disclose all of the accounts for a given client, okay? And in 2009, that bogus account is not here, the 9530 account, the RSCB account's not there. And if we go to the next slide, in 2010, you see, uh, if we can blow it up, the 9530 account is disclosed in 2010 and it's disclosed as somewhere if you can go back, as, as having 140 some thousand dollars. So 
take my word for it, when you're an accountant and you're doing an audit and you're seeing an account that A, you don't know about with a hundred and some thousand dollars and then it was disclosed in 2011, you immediately jump all over that and you get those bank statements and you find out how that money was being allocated. None of that was done in this case. So moving, so that's in essence, I've summarized very briefly the, the accountant's mistakes and how she stole the money. In terms of the bank, uh, one of the primary issues with the bank was the, I'm at a small law firm, and if I go across the street to Chase Bank and say, I want to open up an account in the name of the law firm, I can't do that and shouldn't be allowed to do that. I have to have documentation to show, and in the case of municipality, it has to be a resolution that's voted and said, okay, we're going to open up this account for this purpose, and there have to be multiple co-signers. None of that was done here. There was no evidence at all that a resolution was ever passed. Lastly, remember what I was telling you, she would write the uh, checks payable to treasurer. It was undisputed in this case, you should not be able to negotiate a check simply made out to treasurer. It could be of the, you know, Lions Club or the, you know, of her LLC. You, you can't just negotiate a $500,000 check that's made payable to treasurer, but that's what they did over and over again. So they deposited these checks. And lastly, in the banking world, the, the, the concept is know your client. And this is probably the most basic way in which we believe that the bank made mistakes that allowed this tragedy to continue. When you have um, certain um, occurrences happen in your bank accounts, the software nowadays picks that up. If you have money coming in and going out the same day, if you have um, um, personal expenditures in this case that aren't consistent with the purpose of your client, you should identify that. In this case, we have, this is just one of the countless bank statements. Remember, this was all flowing through the same bank. If it was a different bank, you, we'd have a different discussion, but this is all within this tiny little bank branch two blocks from City Hall. She's got all these personal expenditures for spa, equestrian activities, jewelry, thousands and millions of dollars going through there, right? And this is all in a, quote, City of Dixon account, end quote. And this was right there happening every single day. Um, lastly, um, after pawing through uh, literally hundreds of thousands of pages of documents, I found these. And we believe these are these cash withdrawals. Now there was a conflict, I mean, uh, we were gonna fight about this at trial, but we believe that that is simply a cash withdrawal by Rita. We had like six of these. These are $29,000 and $19,000. We believe those are cash withdrawals because she walked over there and got that much cash. It would be like Ron walking across the street from City Hall saying, I want $100,000 in cash. <laughs> I, I, you know, so you get the idea. So in any event, <laughs> so that's it. Um, the recovery was, uh, we obtained $40 million on behalf of the taxpayers. Um, the, we did it, uh, the fraud was discovered, as I said, in the fall of 2011 by the FBI, uh, thanks to the clerk and the mayor. Rita was arrested in April of 2012. We were hired in May of 2012, and we obtained the $40 million result in September of 2013. So the, and I would note um, that uh, we were offset, or, or that was the assertion by the defense, probably properly, so we were offset by the amount of money that they recovered, that the federal government recovered from the sale of her assets. So she, they recovered, and I don't know what the, I, it's certainly over 10, and I've heard the mayor even say as much as $12 million were recovered by the federal government. So if you take the 40 plus the 10 or 12, whatever it may be, you know, by and large, less fees and expenses, we made the uh, city whole. Um, my takeaway, I've had, I've had the opportunity to speak to some accountants uh, about this, some local governmental officials. It, it, obviously, every different sector has some unique interest in coming from different angles about this case. My takeaway is this. Um, number one, I think this is a poster child example of why you should rotate your accountants in doing the audit. I know that that is the, becoming the standard. I've been on many boards and I know the resistance internally. Oh no, we can't rotate our accountants. Then we gotta get them all trained again. They're gonna be difficult. They went, do it. Because if that would have happened here, we wouldn't be talking. The, the theft would have been a lot less, number one. Professional skepticism. The irony, the sad irony of this case is President Ronald Reagan's hometown is Dixon. His uh, saying was trust but verify. Um, the accounting firm trusted but didn't verify. And so I would suggest that exercising professional skepticism and challenging, even when you've got a very good and long relationship is key. And lastly, it seemed to me from my experience of deposing the people in the case that were on the audit field term that they put younger, less experienced accountants 
on these audit field teams. And if there were more experienced accountants that would ask more questions, this may not have occurred. In terms of the bank, I think the banking uh, practices and procedures need to be adhered to. It may seem commonplace that you have the treasurer walk over and open a bank account, but there are banking standards and there are banking practices that say, we need a resolution. I'm sorry, I know you're the treasurer. We, we need a resolution. We need more than one signer to the account, and those need to be followed. They weren't followed, and this is what happens. Um, it's an honor to represent the taxpayers, um, and uh, I, I guess at the end of the day, I would suggest to you that there's a lot of um, wrongs that may be committed to municipalities and body politics, and um, we're looking now into environmental cases and other embezzlement cases, and uh, the wrongs are out there, and the taxpayers need to be refunded for these wrongs. And thank you for allowing me to be here today. <laughs> Time, by the way, we usually leave at 1:15. But if there's a question, burning, uh, <laughs> well, let's go. Just yell out. What is it? What are they going to do with the money? Excellent question. If the mayor was here, he could answer it better. I was at a city council meeting right after the settlement was announced. The whole, uh, the mayor invited everybody from the city of Dixon that wanted to attend. They had a massive meeting. I don't know, 500 people showed up. They distilled the ideas. And the short answer to your question is they're doing the right thing. They've re reduced the debt. They had to issue a ton of debt and, and interest, right, in order to pay for her theft. Right? So they've reduced their debt dramatically, and they've put the money into wise things like infrastructure that would, uh, was left behind, sewer, infrastructure, things of that nature. Another question. Raise your hand. Yes, just jump up. Um, two Loud. I, I, I can't speak for the federal government. I don't know. I, I, no, I, I just, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Another one. Yes. Do they look back, when they look back at the minutes and constantly being short of cash, do they look back and say, we should have known the village official? Well, you know, that was the constant battle in this civil litigation. The constant battle was, <laughs> it's your client's fault. The, the bank and the accountants, their response was it's a shared responsibility. It's the city's fault. And I bristled Mick at that at every turn because I suggest I suggest and I maintain today the city's duty and responsibility, if I was on that uh, city commission and if I was the mayor of the city, my duty and responsibility is frankly to make sure we send out an RFP and or we obtain the best accountants that we can. And they got a nationwide accounting firm and then after that it's up to them to do their job right. It's like when you go to a doctor and you tell them the symptoms, it, you have to leave it to him or her as to tell you what's wrong and to follow up the diagnostic exams. So, On this side of the room. Yes, in the back, yell it out. Was there ever any thought that there was complicitness between either the accounting firm and the bank, and what's happened to the accounting firm? Um, you get the uh, question. Yeah, so the question is, were there any complicity uh, in any of this? Um, the short answer is, I didn't see any knowledge by the accounting firm that she was stealing money or the bank that she was stealing money or from anybody at the city hall that she was stealing money. And I get that question a lot. The, the, the answer is, I think it was pure negligence. Just to answer her question uh, about federal government oversight, that's why you have auditors. They do the audit in accordance with the uh, standards Couple more, quick. I, yeah, was Rita there was no evidence of that. <laughs> For the record, she was not horsing around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. I'm available, by the way. Go ahead. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. Did any of the professional accountants or bankers uh, admit that they were suspicious but failed to act or encouraged not to act? Um, I, I, the short answer is no. The closest evidence that came out was the question, the, the colloquy between two partners at, at the firm about where she was getting the money with respect to her personal tax returns. So I think that answer, but the answer is uh, other than that, no. One or two more. Yes, sir. Was there any litigation with the insurance carrier regarding errors and omissions with working 
I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I mean, that's a fair answer. I, I don't know. I, my action was the primary action. Moderators, too quick. I'll go ahead. We're real fast. Interesting. Uh, thank you. The question is, were the same public officials in office the entire time, Michelle? And the answer is no. So they changed mayors and city commissioners. This happened under a number of different uh, public officials. Yes. Um, the settlement was made with the city of Dixon and the accounting firm. Who paid it from their end? I have no idea. Yeah. One more, yes. I heard recently in the news that she asked for pension. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so Mr. Guest, who is responsible for pension funds, is asking a good question. Is she going to get her pension? And I don't know what's going on with that, Tim, honestly. I, I honestly. Uh, now, two yeah. quick questions. What did she do for 80000 if she didn't do the bills? What was her job description? Well, apparently she did a, a, a reasonable job at her job duties as comptroller and treasurer. Doing what? Well, <laughs> well, Legitimately, well, what I, did she do? Well, I, I mean... Other than stealing. Well, yeah, so she performed all of the preparing of the budget and the preparing of the reports and things of that nature. Okay, second quick question. Yeah. Didn't someone on the council know that there was money that they, they wanted to spend and they didn't have it? It's all on paper. Did anyone, you know, sort of like... Look at the money? Yeah, so the, the, it's a good question, and the answer is there were questions asked from a mile high level from the city council saying, Where we, why are we short on cash and so on, and she always had very good and, and, and detailed answers for that. State of Illinois is slow in paying, we're getting uh, slow in getting grant money, and she had this whole litany of excuses about why the city was short and they had to issue debt. So. How about a round of applause? <laughs>